Substitution nucleophilic first order reactions, SM1 reactions, often involve solvolysis reactions. In other words, the solvent is involved in the reaction, and specifically the solvent is serving as the nucleophile for the reaction. And so basically what happens is that you have methanol, which often you would think of as being inert, but because that oxygen has some lone pairs on it, it will end up serving as the nucleophile in the reaction. And what that eventually means is that you're going to have both an SN1 reaction and then an acid-base kind of reaction to follow up. So if we walk through the mechanism, you'll see both of it, and then I'll generate a reaction coordinate diagram going through the details. So what we have here is, of course, a tertiary leaving group situation where that pair of electrons can just become a lone pair on the chlorine. And so the result of that first arrow is to generate a chloride that now has a minus charge on it because it now has four lone pairs, whereas before it had three. But it also generates a carbocation, a leftover carbon that was tertiary and is now a planar carbocation intermediate, an sp2 hybridized carbon that's flat, and that has an empty p orbital, and that is plus. Now, of course, this leads to, as in the first SN1 video, a disruption of any stereochemistry that's there, although we didn't have stereochemistry at this point. And again, the most likely scenario at this point would be that the chloride could then go ahead and reattach because you have a plus and a minus close together in proximity, and in fact, the chloride could go ahead and just bind again and head back the way you came. So that means that this is going to be an equilibrium step. However, that is not the only thing that could happen here. In addition to that, which is happening every so often, what has to happen in order for some other new reaction to take place is the methanol needs to surround that chloride and solvate it, and it also needs to surround this carbocation and solvate it, and then separate the two ions from each other. Right now, the situation with the two ions right next to each other is called an ion pair, but if you separate those, first they become a separated ion pair, and eventually they just become their own actual separate ions unrelated. And while that is happening, the methanol is stabilizing both of these because it's the solvent, so it surrounds each one. The H part will be pointed at the chloride, the oxygen part will be pointed at the carbocation, and so it's easy to imagine that since this oxygen is going to be stabilizing that plus anyway, what if it goes ahead and makes a bond? So the re result of this arrow is that now this oxygen has three bonds to it, and I have drawn it as red because it served as the nucleophile. Originally it was the solvent, but it served as the nucleophile and created that bond there. However, the methanol had a hydrogen bound to it already, as well as a methyl bound to that oxygen already. So this oxygen now has three bonds to it and only one lone pair, therefore this oxygen is plus. This is of course an equilibrium step because one of the ways you could solve this problem of an oxygen having a plus would be to have this bond disconnect and become an oxygen lone pair again, and then you'd head back this way. And so this is all in equilibrium. However, at the moment we are surrounded by an absolute sea of methanol molecules because methanol is the solvent and there's lots of them floating around. And so what could happen instead to make that charge go away is one of the nearby methanol oxygens could simply abstract that hydrogen right there and remove that hydrogen and the, the pair of electrons that was between the oxygen and the hydrogen, the OH bond, then becomes a lone pair on the oxygen. The pKa for this oxygen at the moment was about minus two and the pKa for abstracting that hydrogen and putting it on this oxygen will also be about minus two and for the same reason. They are remarkably similar to each other. So in other words, this is energetically neutral. Swapping the hydrogen from one to the other is no difference energetically. So that's good and what it now does is create the final product for the reaction and though of course this could be a one-way step, it's best to think of this also as being equilibrium because you have at least some hydrogens floating around now. So the final product that you're going to get from this process is that a methyl ether. First you had to go through the protonated methyl ether, then you arrive at the methyl ether itself, and the deprotonation step is most certainly the methanol doing the abstraction of the proton. But if you think about what's left over in this entire process, there's a chloride that we also had floating around when all was said and done, and though he is floating as a Cl minus, you're also going to generate a leftover H plus at some point, and so what you might do is mentally think of those two as bound to each other, although it's best not to. It's better to think of this as a Cl minus and a separate H plus that happens to be on whatever methanol and just bouncing from methanol to methanol, all of which again are energetically equivalent. This would give you the impression that maybe the Cl could be the thing that's doing the abstracting of that hydrogen, and so let's at least contemplate that. So we have a Cl minus floating around at this stage as well, and this is of course simply left over from the Cl minus that we had right there. There's no reason why the chloride couldn't be the thing that comes to abstract this proton and push its electrons onto the oxygen. However, the pKa for Cl minus is about minus 7, as opposed to minus 2 for this abstraction. 
In other words, this right here is 100,000 times worse. And that's because Cl minus is the counter ion of a strong acid, which means that it's far less likely that Cl minus acts as a base than it is that another solvent molecule acts as the base. So the reaction coordinate diagram for the entire process starts with the starting materials, which is to say the t-butyl chloride and some methanol here. And then it proceeds through some transition state to a relatively high energy intermediate, which is the carbocation itself. Again, it does not like to form a carbocation in the first place. That is going to be a high energy intermediate. And simply attaching some oxygen into that carbocation will lower the energy of the overall ion substantially. And the reason for that is because this lacks for an octet, whereas this, though it is an oxygen cation, has full octets for everything. So that's going to be lower in energy, much as it always is for our resonance structures. So this is lower in energy, and then the deprotonation step will then release the remainder of the energy. And so the overall process ends up going from relatively higher energy to lower energy. And again, we pass through two different intermediates along the way. Now, formally, this first intermediate is the carbocation that's part of the SN1 type process. And then the SN1 reaction basically stops at this point, which is the protonated ether stage. And then the remainder of this is actually an acid base reaction. And so the thing that makes it an SN1 process is not that you have intermediates in general, it's that you have a specific carbocation intermediate. So the SN1 part is through there, and then we have an acid base reaction that finishes off the reaction as a whole. So a solvolysis reaction in general is almost always going to involve some mechanism like this. You are going to have the leaving group leave, you are going to create the carbocation intermediate that then it marks this as an SN1. You're then going to proceed on to some intermediates where the solvent has attacked, but before you do the acid base that then leads to the final product. This is not the final product because it's not particularly stable as drawn. It is charged. And so in order to end up at the kind of product that you can isolate, you need to remove that charge and make it neutral. And along the way, the thing that's more likely to do the deprotonation is the stronger base. And so methanol is more likely to do that deprotonation because it is 100,000 times more basic than the counter ion of a strong acid, which is HCl. For bookkeeping's sake, you can imagine that HCl is the final thing. But in practice, what you want to do is think about methanol as being the base that does the abstraction of that final proton because energetically that is equivalent. And likewise, whatever your solvent is, it's often a polar product solvent for these kinds of reactions, is more likely to be the base than whatever the counter ion was in the first place. Solvolysis reactions are an SN1 coupled to an acid base.